Sometimes as I sit in quiet reflection, having an introspective moment, I think to myself, YouTube's a big bucket of shit. Take for example what happened over the past weekend. Uh, we'd set up a sub channel, because a lot of people requested it. They said, well, some of your stuff um, doesn't get a whole bunch of views and you're worried that might tank the main channel because of the almighty algorithm. So you should make a sub channel and you could put your podcasts and stuff on there. So we did. We made a sub channel and we put podcasts on there. And over the weekend, Google terminated it. And I got an email from YouTube saying that there were multiple community violations on it, which could include spam or fraud or misleading content. And I appealed it and said, I, at the very least, tell me what the content was that was so bad. What did we do that was so naughty? And they sent an email back just saying they're gonna uphold the termination and that's literally it. So I still don't know what we did wrong, but that's just another reminder of what a constant stress-inducing nightmare it is to work on YouTube. So, you know, here I am on the, on the cover of an official copy of Deadly Premonition. There's only like 10 of these in the world. So YouTube can't take that from me. Fucking, it's almost like YouTube is Sejunianize or something. In all seriousness, I do not have much of a dog in the race with that sub channel. It was getting a couple hundred views. It was literally a, a few people that prefer to listen to podcasts on YouTube instead of SoundCloud or Spotify or iTunes, where the Podquisition podcast is readily available, as is Boston's favorite son, a hilarious podcast that isn't actually funny at all, starring myself and Conrad Zimmerman and Jonathan off Road Rules. But you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's more annoying than anything else that I literally don't know what was wrong with it. And that's YouTube in a nutshell. No one knows what the fuck's wrong with it. Anyway, this guff. You may not be able to count on a video game publisher for much, but you can always trust them to adopt a new money-making method as quickly and enthusiastically as possible. In fact, publishers appear to be far less interested in making video games as they are hubs of monetization. Minimum viable products that exist purely to shake down customers for extra cash in addition to what they've already paid to access said products. From DLC to microtransactions to season passes to silver and gold editions, video games are always bolstering their monetization techniques with fresh awfulness, desperately glomming onto whatever get richer quicker scheme they can. Not to please you the customer, never you the customer, but shareholders the Skeksis. It's becoming quite clear that the latest ploy to grab publisher attention is the subscription model. By no means a new idea, this concept of a perpetual payment plan for continued access has seen new vigour in the age of the online service. Ever since popular MMOs like World of Warcraft demonstrated you could get away with charging money for a game people already bought, Publishers have had wet dreams about grabbing some of that recurrent user spending for themselves. Unfortunately for them, there wasn't room on top of the mountain for every MMO to succeed, and the gold rush saw far more losses than wins in the market. MMOs, in my opinion, were rarely, if ever, good value prospects for players. Most of them aren't even good games to begin with, limited in scope and repetitive and full of other monetization methods. But the popular ones were, of course, mega successful. Subscription models have come back in a major way during the latter half of this decade, and corporations around the world want in on the action. Subscriptions for access to streaming television kicked off largely by Netflix is steadily becoming the new cable TV, as entertainment companies are moving away from unified services to offering their own bespoke channels for a fee. From HBO to Disney to Stars to Shudder to even fucking Full Moon Studios, yes, the Puppet Master people, it seems every TV channel, every movie company wants a slice of that recurrent revenue pie all to themselves. And it kinda fucking sucks. 
Just having Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or any combination of those three ought to be enough. But no, companies don't like sharing and are intent on twisting and breaking any emergent business model so it resembles an older business model. A model in which they get to make and keep all of the money. Though funnily enough, it's encouraging piracy in some cases. Because the market has proven that it pays for convenience. When music became available in a unified format on iTunes, music piracy went down because it was more convenient to pay for it on iTunes. But access to content is getting inconvenient again. It's now hard to keep track of what TV show you can watch on what service. And Disney pulled a major boner with Disney Plus, not making it available in certain countries, which is a little counterproductive when companies like Disney have relied on FOMO fear of missing out to get people to pack out theatres and jump immediately on their latest releases. Consequently, the much-hyped Disney Plus exclusive The Mandalorian was pirated within three hours. Given the lack of a worldwide rollout for Disney Plus, coupled with its breeding of FOMO, Disney has no one else to blame but its fucking self. And really, if media piracy as a whole makes a major comeback, it's on all of those corporate heads. Because the moment you make piracy more convenient than paying for content, people are gonna pirate. Anyway, I went on a wild tangent there. Where were we? Right, we were talking about, like, all of the content being carved up into little fiefdoms. Basically, what used to be a cool idea is probably going to suck harder over the next few years as the content's carved up and we're expected to pay more money, probably more overall than one already pays for cable, to access all of our shit. Mandalorian isn't even all that good. Anyway, despite MMOs having died down considerably since the early portion of the decade, the idea of subscription services for individual games is looking set to make a comeback in a way that leaves something of a sour taste. In a previous video, we discussed subscription services that provide access to multiple games and streaming platforms, such as the utterly bereft of value Google Stadia Pro Plan, or Electronic Arts' EA Access stuff that provides benefits to customers across multiple titles. Today, we're looking at recent MMO-style subscriptions tied to individual games that the era of the live service has reinvigorated. As more games become perpetual, always online experiences, the line between regular product and MMO has well and truly blurred. Blurred just enough for subscriptions to start sneaking their way back in while taking on a variety of forms. The Battle Pass has been one major success, something else we've talked about in the past. And I don't necessarily have a problem with them if they're done right and they are in appropriate games, say free-to-play ones. The ridiculous worldwide success of Fortnite allowed Epic Games to mainstream the idea of a premium service that offered additional benefits to those who stump up the cash. The typical Battle Pass model as codified in Fortnite takes the form of extra gameplay challenges that reward players with a new items such as cosmetics and emotes. Commonly, Battle Passes last for individual seasons, making them timed events that encourage players to continue playing in order to make good on their investments. And this of course means they can sell another Battle Pass when the next season rolls in, effectively making it a piecemeal subscription. Other video games, ones that that aren't free to play like Fortnite have been plenty eager to copy the Battle Pass system. Call of Duty Modern Warfare now has a Battle Pass, though the system had been delayed to December quite some time after the actual game launched, and while that delay was supposedly unplanned, it is sort of par for the course for Activision. Sell the game first, shovel the monetization in later. Destiny 2 helped itself to the idea as well, with world changing seasons running every three months. When Last I talked about Battle Passes, I said we can expect to see publishers take an enthusiastic interest in them, and that certainly seems to be the case so far. But here's the problem with Battle Passes from a publisher's perspective. They take a lot of effort and ingenuity to maintain. You need to keep coming up with challenges and content and events and rewards. For some companies, that's just going to be way too much for the creatively bankrupt hack fucks to want to bother with. Speaking of creatively bankrupt hack fucks, Bethesda has provided an adequate example of what we may very well be seeing more of in the future.
Fallout 76 is a trash video game. I think I've emphasised that more than enough times by now, but I still like emphasising it because Fallout 76 is a fucking trash video game. A so-called live service taking place in a mostly lifeless world, the broken, buggy, threadbare, distinctly undercooked game introduced the Fallout First Premium Subscription Service this year, and it's about as garbage as the rest of Fallout 76's bullshit. In a theme common for most methods of video game monetization, Fallout First offered a number of solutions to problems Bethesda developed on purpose, and offered things the community had requested for a while at the princely sum of $100 a year! $100 a year! 12 fucking 99 a month! 100 bucks though! No licky tongue! Licky licky what? Anyway, in exchange for a hundred dollar a year subscription to a game that isn't even worth the upfront 60 buck asking price, Fallout First offers private servers, unlimited scrap storage, an extra fast travel point, a monthly drip feed of premium currency, alongside some emotes and an NCR Ranger outfit. This is on top of the microtransactions that are already in the game, those ones that were supposed to be just cosmetic, but have steadily included more and more games gameplay affecting items as time's gone on, because they think you're stupid and that you won't notice. Naturally, because Bethesda is Bethesda and Bethesda is Bethetic, Fallout First was utterly broken on launch, the private servers were not in actuality private, and the unlimited scrap storage actually ate people's scrap, eradicating paying customers resources like they were a whole bag of licker tongues. I know I've talked about the failure of the Fallout First launch before, but it just hasn't stopped being amazing to me. The sheer bottomless pit that is Bethesda Bethesda's ineptitude. But Bethesda's never-ending laughability isn't the point here. The point here is the potential this has for normalising the idea that $60 games will feature premium subscription services going forward, in addition to previous methods of monetization shoveled in, because it's rarely ever an instead-of situation, and almost always an as-well-as situation when it comes to in-game money-making. So, as well as DLC microtransactions, transactions, loot boxes and multiple special editions, we now have to be on the lookout for contrived and convoluted subscription services that, like all the other monetization schemes, carve out content to sell back to us and solve problems that the companies themselves created. And unlike MMOs, these subscription services can be introduced at any time. At least with a traditional MMO, you knew what you were getting into up front. Fallout first appeared almost a year after the game came out, and we've talked about how many manipulative post-launch monetization is before these delayed transactions. Get someone hooked on the game first and then introduce more ways for them to spend money on their new habit. Sort of like offering a just cosmetic microtransaction store at launch and then adding gameplay affecting items over time. Bethesda. But on the topic of these subscriptions being used as premium solutions to in-game problems, just to listen to one player who claimed criticism of the Fallout First service was manufactured outrage, justify their purchase of that subscription without realising the case they were making against it. I get two days off a week, sometimes less. I don't have time to grind challenges for atoms or fight to farm for workshops. Mmm, spoken a bit like a mark. Fallout 76, like so many of these live services now, is a grind. A churning slog of repetitive busywork. A chore for which many players don't have time. And if you don't have time to progress in a video game you bought to literally play in your spare time, that seems to be a pretty big fucking problem. An issue with the game's design. A problem which Bethesda has solved for you at a price. Another price on top of what it already got from you. It's basically like pushing you down a hole and selling you a ladder. Given how popular this whole scheme has gotten this decade, I'm going to use a shorthand from now on and call it solution selling. Now that can be its own comprehensive video, but this selling of solutions to problems that shouldn't be there has been thoroughly experimented with in Nintendo's latest mobile scam. With the boring and shallow Animal Crossing Pocket Camp getting not one, 
but two subscription models, both of which offer entirely different benefits, so you'll need to subscribe twice if you want those advantages, because of fucking course you do, for fuck's sake, why isn't Ekans in Pokemon Sword and Shield, for fuck's sake? Now, the game's free to play, which some feel may excuse the whole charade, but it's still two distinct subs that are total bollocks. And trust me, I know my subs. The cheaper subscription, the Happy Helper plan, is a classic case of solution selling. In the two years since it launched, Pocket Camp has gotten steadily more grinding and demanding of the player's time. Items that used to be bought with in-game currency started asking for the premium currency, while regular events that used to require only casual attention now require the player to log in multiple times a day to keep pace. Basically, the game did what a lot of games do now and demanded more and more from the player in exchange for less and less. A problem that Happy Helper solves by giving you a drip feed of premium currency and the ability to have a villager do the game's myriad chores for the player while they're away. Create a problem, steadily over the course of two years and then sell those players still hooked on the game a ladder out of the hole they've been pushed into. The other subscription is just fucking grotesque. For $7.99 a month, that's right, $7.99 a cock in month, you get five loot boxes. Yes, all of the exploitative gambling fun of loot boxes with the steady wallet drain of a subscription. Five gamble boxes a month for eight friggin' bucks. More money than Apple Arcade wants for dozens upon dozens upon dozens of pretty top quality full-fledged games. It's quite frankly disgusting and completely highlights what I said about subscriptions being piled on top of existing monetization. With Pocket Camp, we have a subscription that actively promotes and supports the existing monetization. Given all the evidence and everything this very show has said about loot boxes and their potential to get players compulsively gambling with them, paying for five free hits a month just reeks of particularly manipulative malevolence. And now, a brief tangent about one of the impacts of premium subscription services that I wanted to elegantly weave into the video but didn't find a good place for it, so I'm just gonna pop it in here. Another thing worth mentioning is what we've called on this channel the haves and have not mentality. The idea that some people have something and other people are the poorer, lower class. Now this was discussed in a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way on a Polygon article when Fallout first hit. There were people who were hunting, allegedly. It wasn't as big a deal as people were making out, but there were a couple of people um, hunting Fallout first subscribers and there was this strange little class war. And while it was in some ways in good fun, some of the Fallout First subscribers started acting like aristocrats uh, for a laugh. It does highlight that haves and have nots mentality. And this is something the game industry is well aware of. People like Torolf Jernstrom, who we've quoted on this show before, they talk about how they want uh, to have this socially acceptable way to play a game. And the socially acceptable way they want you to play a game is by spending money on it. That's what cosmetics are there for. They're there to show off status. They're there to show off that you're better than the others, that you've got more money, that you've spent more cash on the game and are treated better as a result. That's what something like Fallout First is doing. That's something that subscription services going forward will want to advertise, promote. They won't be upfront about it, but there will be the implication. The implication that you're better that you're more socially acceptable than others. Something to think about. Anyway, back to Nintendo. Nintendo's bastardry here follows the release of that piece of shit gacha game Mario Kart Tour, which itself has a 5 99 subscription service, behind which the 200cc race mode is locked. And while Nintendo's crass nonsense is currently restricted to mobile, the predatory mobile market is often the shape of things to come, so we're getting a potential glimpse of what may be in store for players across the board next generation. Subscription fees have always been a treasured desire of publishers, as evidenced by the MMO Gold Rush, and companies in multiple industries want to have that baseline guarantee of repeated revenue. We're in an age where you can subscribe to boxes of nerdy tat, to shaving equipment, to fucking bacon if you want. And there's not just one bacon service, oh no! Here's a list of the top seven bacon subscriptions! Top seven! Top 7, implying 
Way more than seven exist. $400 a year bacon subscription? Fucking what? Eh, still a better deal overall than Fallout first. Subscriptions are lucrative. They can get a lot of money, not in exchange for new products, but for continued access to current ones. They can be used just like microtransactions to solve design problems for a fee. Customers can easily lose track of subscriptions, especially with the ever-growing amount of them. And it's often suggested that many Americans pay for subs they don't even use. Like my stupid ass has been doing with Kindle Unlimited because I keep saying I should read more books. As if simply saying that makes up for the fact I'm an ignorant dullard who doesn't actually read books but I really should read more books. Of course, like with the live service Gold Rush and the military shooter Gold Rush and the rhythm game Gold Rush and the MMO Gold Rush, there is not indefinite space atop the market mountain. We are being expected to subscribe to so much these days. Multiple television and movie services, a growing selection of video game streaming services, Banana Republic clothes rental services, that's one. It's already getting a bit much. And this is before more game companies decide to take Bethesda and Nintendo's queue and start shoveling premium membership on top of their already overly monetized AAA games. I've said before that the live service market is pretty unsustainable across a whole industry because the audience's time is finite. So too will a mass adopted subscription market also be unsustainable because most people aren't made of fucking money. Especially millennials who are accused of killing industries because they don't buy enough diamonds or play enough golf. Probably because they're having to do multiple fucking jobs just to make rent. Which itself is a fairly unethical concept. Did you know there are six empty houses for every one homeless person? Almost as if capitalism has created the problem of homelessness to sell the solution which is a subscription to a fucking home. Oh but boo hoo the big Billionaires might get taxed a bit more. They'll have a little bit less of a comical amount of money that no human being will ever fucking need in their stupid fucking life or the lives of their fucking children. Wait a minute, where was I? Wait, what the hell was I doing? I blacked out for a moment just then. Oh, well, I've left the record button on, so I'll have to go back and see what I said. We will have to see what happens with subscription services in future. We've got those overall ones coming up. Stadia Pro's already out there. EA Access is a thing. Ubisoft and Square Enix are eyeing up their own premium services. So I guess the incoming years will show us exactly how sustainable the subscription era really is. Probably a bit more sustainable than planet Earth that's dying because of climate change. Oh god, I'm blacking out again. And take photo. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I got a bit distracted because, as you'll see from the photo, the way this Boglin's hand is inadvertently positioned, it's uh, copying a feel of miniature fantasy Willem Dafoe's arse. So, so that's good. Before we end, I'm still trying to shill a little bit more. Not all the time, but just a little bit more. Um, just because I do not advertise any of the stuff that I do and, and the ways in which one can fund me at all. So I'm trying to boost that up. But if you did like today's video, if you like anything we do at the Gymquisition, if you like any of the ad-free content that we do on this channel, you can support it at patreon.com slash gymquisition. You don't have to, no content is gated off. It's um, a fully optional pay what you want subscription service. Um, there is one bonus in the uh, patrons can ask questions that will get answered on a podcast, but anyone can listen to the podcast because like I say, no content's gated off. In addition to that, I've started doing live streaming now. How excited, that's at Twitch. How excited, how exciting. That's at Twitch TV slash Gymquisition. Again, uh, it's fairly easy to work all this shit out. And as I said earlier, we've got podcasts. So if you look up uh, Podquisition or Boston's Favourite Son or the Spin-Off Doctors on iTunes, Spotify, uh, the other one, SoundCloud, uh, you will find our audio samplings and that'll do. You know, you can listen to that, you can support the page, you can watch me on Twitch, but whatever you do and however you do it, you should always thank God for me.